Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this wonderful event and celebration of International Education Series. My name is Annabelle Haudegui, and I am the Administrative Assistant for the Department of Multicultural Affairs. Behind me is Diana Cordova, and she's the Director for the Department. For our event today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Peter Stein. He was born in 1936 in Prague, Czech Czechoslovakia, to a Jewish father and a Catholic mother, just two years before the Nazi occupation. Mr. Stein attended public schools in New, in New York, learned English, graduated from the City College of New York, and earned his PhD in sociology from Princeton University. For a number of years, he worked as a professor of sociology and co-director of the Holocaust and Genocide Study Center at William Patterson University in Wayne, New Jersey. He taught courses on the Holocaust and developed workshops for teachers and community members. Today, he shares his story through his memoir. A Boy's Journey, From Nazi-Occupied Prague to Freedom in America. Please allow me to welcome him. Throughout the presentation, you are encouraged to enter any questions in the chat, and then at the end, um, Dr. Stein will answer them. And I will now go ahead and let him take it away. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. I'm talking to you from Washington, D.C., where spring is springing, but I would prefer to be with you at Eastern New Mexico University. Perhaps one day I will. My niece lived in New Mexico for about 15 years when she was a young woman. So I, I know it's a great place to live. And I want to thank particularly Annabelle Haragui, who organized today's presentation, and Diane Cordova, the Director of Multicultural Affairs at your university. Today is also Holocaust Remembrance Day, or in Hebrew, Yom HaShoah, which is a tribute to the millions of men, women, and children who perished during the Holocaust. Uh, it ended 76 years ago, and yet genocides continue. Unfortunately, uh, genocides continue around the globe. And what are genocides, especially the targeting of different ethnic, religious, racial, or national groups for their destruction? So the Holocaust is one outstanding example of genocide, but genocides tragically continue around the world. So today I'll talk both about the Holocaust and particularly my family and my experiences for maybe a half hour or 35 minutes. And then I welcome all your comments and questions and I hope we have a good dialogue. And uh, Annabelle is going to advance the slides and I will ask her in Proxima. So, so this is the cover of the book. And I finished the book about a year ago. I'm a sociologist by training. So most of my writing has been sociological, but this is very personal. And on the cover of my book is me in the second grade in Prague and behind me, some of the bomb, some of the buildings in Prague that were bombed. Uh, and the book also has a lot of photographs, some of which I'll show you today. Next, please. So I have to remind you that I'm an immigrant. That is, I came here from another country. And so many Americans have immigrated here. Perhaps some of you or your parents or your grandparents. Uh, America has all, always been a land of immigrants. And on a November evening in 1948, my mom, Helen and I sailed into New York Harbor past the Statue of Liberty. Statue of Liberty was a gift to the United States from France. And if you've ever seen her, her torch is lit up, the crown is lit up. We, it was about seven or eight in the evening and we, our breaths were taken away. <clears throat> but I was particularly interested in looking at the Manhattan side and looking at for the Empire State Building. Why the Empire State Building? 
I had seen the original black and white King Kong film in Prague after the war. And I wanted to see the gorilla carrying Fay Ray up, up the crown to the Empire State Building. My mother said, no, it's time to go to bed. And I, I never got to meet King Kong. The, the next day, we were greeted. Yeah, Proxima. Uh, uh, we were greeted on the New York side by our sponsors. And you may know that the US government requires every immigrant to have sponsors so that we wouldn't become wards of the state. This is my aunt, Marianne Alltheim, who was escaped Vienna, Austria, just as Hitler was taking over Austria. She spent the war working at Macy's on 34th and 7th Avenue in the stamp department because she had been trained as a stamp uh, dealer and collector. And her husband, <clears throat> Leo Alltheim, could not get an American passport. So he spent the war in Shanghai, uh, which was, it's Shanghai, China, which was occupied by Japan. But he and about 30,000 other Jewish men and women and children were able to uh, survived the war there. <clears throat> they became my surrogate parents. And uh, Leo was a terrific dad who took me to my first baseball game at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, where I saw <laughs> Jackie Robinson, the first African American to play in the major league, uh, major league baseball. And it was uh, an amazing experience. Proxima. So this is where it started. Czechoslovakia is a country smack dab in the middle of Europe, surrounded by some not uh, nice neighbors, Germany, Austria, Ukraine, Poland, and off the map to the right, the Soviet Union. The star in the map indicates Prague, the capital of Czechoslovakia, where my parents were born and where I lived and I was born. And if you Take your eyes north of there, you'll see the words Terezin with an arrow. And Terezin was the major concentration camp, really a ghetto and an area from which prisoners were sent to Poland, to Auschwitz, primarily Auschwitz. All of my Jewish relatives went through Terezin uh, and few survived. Next. So uh, this is Prague, and this is where my family and I lived in the castle. You could see my room, it's the third, forgive me, that's a bad joke. Uh, Prague Castle is where the king lived, and uh, it gives you some sense of the history of the place. The Holy Roman Empire with King Charles was housed in the Prague Castle in the 13 and 1400s. Proxima. Uh, this is the Charles Bridge. Uh, Prague is divided into two sections, the old town and the new town. And this is a pedestrian bridge. I took this photograph on a Sunday a number of years ago. Uh, and it's the bridge that was crossed by German troops in 1939 when they invaded Czechoslovakia. And in 1945 by Soviet troops when they liberated Prague. The river in the photograph is called Vltava in Czech or Moldau in German. And it's important for my life for two reasons. I learned how to swim in this river. We lived about 20 minutes to the right out of sort of a suburb of Prague. So that's why I learned how to swim. And in the winter, the river froze up and we would ice skate and try to play hockey. Next. Uh, on a sunny, beautiful day in May 1934, my Jewish father, Victor, married my Catholic mother, Zdenka. Not in a church, not in a synagogue, but town hall. So it was a civil ceremony, and there they are, uh, looking happy and 
pleased. And the fact that they fell in love with each other saved my father's life because he went to Terezin, to the concentration camp towards the end of the war, unlike the rest of his family who were sent uh, five, uh, two or three years earlier in 1942. Next. So the childhood bef before Hitler showed up was very pleasant. My mom was a very supportive, very loving mother who took care of me, fed me, clothed me, uh, wheeled me around. And during the war, part of the war, she was a single mother. She had to do all of that on her own. My dad liked to swim. He introduced me to swimming. And it's something that I still enjoy doing today. And on the right, uh, we're outside of his office. Next slide. Uh, what he did uh, was, uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a moment, but he ran a wood factory. In 1938, Hitler and the Nazis were threatening to invade Czechoslovakia. The Czech army was mobilized. My dad was the first lieutenant in the army. They were called up. The major problem, and they had pretty good equipment. These are French built tanks that the Czechs had, but there's 7 million Czechs and 70 million Germans. So in about a week after the skirmishes, they stopped and uh, Germany won. Next slide. Uh, oh, there's my dad in the first lieutenant uniform. And you'll notice he's got a sword. So this is not something that you go into a battle with. You, know, you go to a parade with that. But uh, he and so many other Czech soldiers were unhappy that they didn't get to fight the Germans. But I think it would have been a pretty skewed battle. Next slide. So by March 15, 1939, the Nazis occupied Prague. And about six months later, World War II started when Germany invaded Poland on September 1, 1939. Next slide. The Germans also brought the Holocaust. And the Holocaust is a unique type of genocide. It was a systematic murder of Jewish men, women, and children. So basically six out of nine million Jews who had lived in Europe before the war were murdered in the camps or killing centers or by the army in all kinds of ways, in ghettos, they were stars. And uh, I've taught classes and I've written about the Holocaust. It's a grim, grim reminder of, uh, uh, of, of the terrible killing of one group by another. The Holocaust was also the destruction of the 2000 year old Jewish communities. Jews had been in Europe for more than 2,000 years. The oldest Jewish community in Europe is in Greece, of all places. Next. In addition to Jews, there were at least 5 million other victims of the Holocaust. And in this photograph in the upper left, you see a group of Polish priests being arrested, and they were sent to Auschwitz. Uh, many of them died there. Below in the second photo is a group of homosexual men, German men, who were sent to Bergen-Belsen and uh, treated terribly, and most of them perished as well. The others, other victims were political prisoners, communists and socialists, Russian and Polish army prisoners. I mentioned clergy and nuns, Jehovah's Witnesses, homosexuals and lesbians, Romani, and anyone who is physically and mentally disabled. So it affected a lot of people. Proxima. So from the macro, we go to the micro. Here's the Stein family on, in 1912, that is two years before World War I, on a German beach for a holiday. My guess is it wasn't terribly hot, 
My grandfather, Joseph, is in the middle, a successful grain merchant who could afford to bring his wife and four children to the beach. And I'll talk a little bit more about his wife, my grandmother, Sophie. Uh, but the, the tragedy of this photograph is that only two people survived the Holocaust. My dad in the sailor uniform, he's eight or nine years old, sitting on the sand. And next to him, his cousin, Emma, his beloved cousin, who also married a Christian man and thereby managed to save her life, Proxima. Am I saying it right, Proxima? So here are my grandparents. My uh, Joseph dies a year after I'm born, uh, before the invasion. But Sophie, at age 78, uh, Sophie, my grandmother, may her memory be blessed, uh, was sent on a train at age 78 from Prague to Terezin alone. She was a diabetic. All of her insulin was confiscated by the German guards, as were the needles she needed to inject the insulin. And if any of you know about diabetes or have relatives, you know that they, people have to inject insulin periodically. She died in 19 days after coming to Terezin in what must have been a terrible death. But I have a childhood memory of her coming to our apartment and uh, talking to my parents. And she brought chicken liver, a delicacy that my dad liked, liked and I did too. And the, after they finished their meeting in the living room, she came to the kitchen where I was munching uh, in tears. And she gave me a big hug and she said, I love you. I never saw her again, Proxima. My, uh, my two aunts, Carla and Kamala, both married, both with husbands and children, were sent to Auschwitz where they perished. And the little guy in the photographs is me with them. Next. Richard and Elsa Stein, my favorite relatives, uh, they had no children. So whenever they visited, I got, I got gifts. I was spoiled, uh, stuffed animals, toy soldiers, you name it. They were sent to Mali Trustinets, which was a straight extermination camp in Belarus. 99% of people who were sent to Mali Trustinets perished. Next. My dad was Victor Stein. He had a degree in engineering and he started his own business. Next slide. The business was called Standard Bentwood. So he made all kinds of things out of Bentwood, including this wheelbarrow and particularly tennis rackets. And you see a uh, young boy and a group of women carrying their tennis rackets. And my dad's great joy was the fact that one of the four members of the French Davis, Davis Cup team, uh, Jean Borot, played with the standard racket for several years. But that didn't change the Nazis. Next slide. And he was sent to he, uh, what's called forced labor for two years. He was a mystical figure for me. He would come and go and disappear and come back. But finally, in 1944, he was sent to Terezin, which was called Theresienstadt in German. And above the entrance to every concentration camp were the German words, Arbeit macht frei, which means work will make you free, which of course was a complete lie, uh, but it was meant to deceive people thinking, oh, if they kept their nose clean, if they worked, they would survive. Next. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is what Terezin looked like. It was built for soldiers in the 19th century, but became a prison for Jewish prisoners and completely overcrowded. People could bring a limited uh, number of things with them. 
and they have to make a decision. How do I dress for the winter, for the summer? What do I bring? How do I survive? Next slide. Uh, after I got my BA, my college degree, I persuaded my dad to go back to Terezin. And this was a rendering of the men's barracks where he slept, which was uh, barracks were built to house, to hold 40 people. The winter he was there, it had almost 400. Not enough food, terribly cold, vermin, uh, mice, rats, the whole, just horrible and hard work. So much so that 30 to 40,000 people died in Terezin itself, including, of course, my grandmother. The rest were shipped out. Next slide. Finally, in 1945, the war ends. The Soviet army liberates Terezin. And on a truck like this one, my dad came back home. I was watching the, the road. And uh, one day, <clears throat> a truck pulls up. 10 or 12 people wearing the yellow star, which signified the Jewishness were there. One was my dad, and it was the happiest day of my life to see him again. And he hugged my mom and me, and we, we were reunited. Next slide. My job was to go to school. So here I am in the second grade of Prague, learning how to read and write and using that pen with, with the ink that always leaked, I came home with blue hands, but there I am. Next slide. <clears throat> this is a picture of our second grade. We had two teachers, Mr. Novak and, uh, and Ms. Prochaska, and I am in the second row uh, trying to master writing. And uh, we had the boy in front of me in the first row was Joseph, class bully. And he called me a Jew. And my mother said, never tell anyone that your father's Jewish. We got into a fight. I got home, came home with a bloody nose. But that's the way it was. What's missing from this photograph is the front of the classroom, which had a picture of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi flag. So Monday through Friday, we knew who was in charge. I learned something else from my Catholic grandfather, I'll tell you in a moment. Next slide. So <clears throat> the question is, how did I feel? And I felt fear was a major uh, feeling that I had. Relatives disappeared, <clears throat> my Jewish parents, uh, grandparents and relatives disappeared. And these soldiers were in the streets all the time, in the streets, cafes, trams, you name it. And I just didn't know, you know, what was happening next. Next slide. I had one incident on the tram. I took a tram, excuse me, from where we lived, about 20 minutes out of Prague to school. And I'm sitting on the tram one day early in the morning, reading a book, suddenly uh, in German, I hear the words, get up and give me your seat. And it was an SS officer, someone who looked like this. And every kid in Prague knew to stay away from the SS officers. You, you note the letters SS on the lapel, on the collar of his uniform. You'll see skull and bones on the cap and the German eagle. These were the most ruthless division of the German army. And I got up frightened. I put a book back in my knapsack. I ran as far away from him as I could on the train. When I got to school, uh, the teacher, Miss Novak, saw how upset I was. Uh, I thought he knew where my dad was. <clears throat> then I thought maybe he'll follow me. It was a scary episode, but it was war. Next slide. The, the only fun we had were two things, playing football, and here we call it soccer, but I think in Mexico and in Europe, it's called football. <clears throat> and that's what we did. Uh, and we liked it, A, because there were no soldiers there, and B, there were no parents there. 
the other game that we played, next slide, was ice hockey. <clears throat> and the Czechs love ice hockey. So that was, and, and again, it got us away from the reality of war. Next slide. Uh, Prague itself, the capital that I mentioned, <clears throat> was bombed only a few times. There were a lot of flights, especially in 1944 and 1945, as the war heated up. <clears throat> British, Canadian, and American airline, uh, American airs, <laughs> American planes, sorry. <clears throat> I'm thinking of American Airlines. I'm not going to fly soon. But anyway, the bombers flew over Prague. But on February 1945, uh, 40 American bombers bombed the heck out of Prague. Why? It was the same day they were bombing Dresden in Germany. And some of the American pilots misread uh, the maps the topography of Prague was similar to that of Dresden. About 700 Czechs died that day in Prague. 1,400 were injured. They had a hospital that you, you could see the residential homes in the background. And we were in school in the basement. Uh, some of the younger kids were crying. The teachers were upset. It was a terrible, terrible day. And my mom was working in a German factory, and I was afraid of what might happen that day. She survived, but it was a tough day. Next. <clears throat> uh, our Catholic, my, my mother's parents, Zdenka and Antonin, were really rocks during the war. <clears throat> and almost every Sunday we'd go there for lunch. My grandmother, despite the restrictions, food restrictions, managed to get a chicken or pork or something to make on Sunday. <clears throat> and my grandfather at six o'clock in the evening took me and my cousin Robert into a study. Next slide. And there in the study, we would listen illegally to the London broadcast of what was happening in the war. And uh, this was against the law, but we would hear that uh, that we were uh, uh, that we heard that the allies were winning. <clears throat> this is not a picture of us, unfortunately. It's it's one that I found uh, of, and these are people with earphones. We didn't have earphones, and the Germans jammed the radio, so after a while it was very difficult to listen. But among the broadcasts I heard was the Allied invasion of Normandy, what's called the D-Day. And we heard about the bravery of the Americans, the Canadians, and other allies in storming those beaches. <clears throat> and if you ever want to see a powerful anti-war movie, see one called Saving Private Ryan. Sorry, I get a little weepy. In the first half hour, you'll see the hell of war. Next slide. So when I give talks, sometimes students question why Jews didn't resist. Why did six million go like sheep to the slaughter? And I have to remind everyone that Jews resisted, but for the most part, it was nearly impossible. They didn't have arms, they didn't have weapons. They couldn't communicate, but some resisted and survived. Four different couples in my, four different parts of my family. Here, Jan and Tomas Marcus uh, on the escaped Auschwitz and they escaped the death march. <clears throat> There's a whole chapter in my book about their very moving experience. This is Jan and his bride on his wedding day after the war. My dad is on the left having survived camp, and Tomas is on the right. <clears throat> and basically their parents were killed within the first hour or two of coming to Auschwitz. They survived two years, they, they survived the terrible death march, and they resisted. It's an amazing story. Next slide. Another relative in this, from left to right, that's my mom, 
Kurt Fanta and his wife Malvinka. So Kurt was a member of the Czech army and he, when the Czechs lost, he joined the Czech army in the Soviet Union. He fought valiantly, he was injured. Malvinka was a Russian Jewish nurse who uh, helped him survive. And they came to Prague after the war. And there's my dad in the photo and that's me. He was truly at age 10 in Prague. Next slide. Another relative was uh, Janek Steiner. Uh, there are three rows. It's the people, the guys who are standing up. Second from the left, he was a physician. He was a doctor and he flew with the 311th Squadron with the Royal Air Force. And he changed his name from Steiner to Stevens in case he was shot down so that the Germans would not know immediately that he was Jewish. He was Stevens. Very interesting, very brave uh, uncle. Next slide. And here we are with my dad and mom in Prague. It took us almost two years to get a visa to come to the United States. My dad was trying to get some money out uh, after the Germans confiscated his factory, <clears throat> the communists nationalized it. So the poor guy ran into some <laughs> political trouble. So I left with my mom. Uh, we, but anyway, here we are in, uh, in freedom for a while in Prague. Next slide. And I show you, I found a picture of my naturalization in case I ever run for office and somebody says, uh, you were not naturalized, I can tell them, yes, I was. There I am in 1955. Uh, and it was one of the proudest moments of my life. Next photo. A um, couple of more things and I'll stop. I'm concerned about the increasing anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial, both in the United States and in Europe. And deniers claim that the Holocaust never happened or it wasn't that bad, it wasn't official Nazi policy or that the number of deaths are exaggerated. And in the first college where I taught in New Jersey, one of my colleagues was a Holocaust denier. How did I find out? Four of his students came to my office in tears and in anger because one of the girls, one of the young Jewish women had a grandmother who survived Auschwitz and the instructor wouldn't let her talk. And he said, the only reason the Jews died is because Germany was being attacked by America and they didn't have enough food for themselves. It was just outright lies. But this continues, it continues today. Uh, and next slide. Uh, according, uh, there's an organization whose name is at the bottom of the slide, but I, I call the Southern Poverty Law Center. And in 2021, they identified more than 1,000 hate groups in the United States, 112 neo-Nazi groups, new Nazis, and it includes other extremists, white supremacists, domestic terrorists, like the ones that had invaded Congress on January 6th, anti-Hispanic, anti-Asian, anti-LGBTQ, and anti-Muslim. So these groups continue to exist in the United States today, despite the fact that the Holocaust ended some 76 years ago. Next slide. Uh, domestic terrorism increases and the Capitol riot, we heard the thing and we were about 10 minutes away from the Capitol and we saw some of the people who were involved going to the march, going to the invasion and coming back. And the ones we saw looked like everybody else. But, you know, they were wearing regular clothing, but there they attacked the Congress 
while they were in session. There were examples of racism, uh, the Confederate flag appeared and so did nooses. Next photograph. You might have seen this. There was a noose hanging in Congress. Well, what's worse symbol for African-Americans than a hanging noose in, 19, in 2021? And the anti-Semitism is on the right. A guy wearing a Camp Auschwitz sweatshirt that says work brings freedom. Remember I told you Arbeit macht frei in every concentration camp? So he's making a joke out of it. Work brings freedom. And this kind of anti-Semitism is terrible. It's terrible and sends the wrong message. And of course, is terrible for any Holocaust survivors. I have a few more slides. Next. So what do I do? Uh, I'm a volunteer at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. This was my last live performance in February 2020, 138th graders from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I thought, well, what, what do these kids know from Chattanooga? They were terrific. They asked great questions. They were involved. They had done their reading. And there I am with a jacket. Uh, no tie uh, in the museum, and uh, it gives my gives me a lot of meaning to teach and talk about this. And the other person, next slide, that gives me meaning is our grandson, who's now almost six. But you can see the the picture on the right that he's headed for Congress, and he I I hope he gets elected, and uh, I hope he. Uh, he helps all of us. Uh, it's a delight. Uh, we just recently moved in with my son, his wife, and Jackson. And every morning at 7 a.m., Jackson comes into the bedroom, knocks on the door, says, hi, Grandma, hi, Grandpa. And it's delightful. My last slide uh, tries to deal with the question of what to do. And I go back to a painting by Norman Rockwell, the American artist, that appeared on the Saturday Evening Post, April 1961. And he says, he applies the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In other words, be aware of what other people need, what they want, what frightens them, what gives them pleasure. And I think this is such a great diverse uh, painting of so many different religions, ethnicities, races coexisting. And I think that's where, what we need to do. We need to educate and learn how to live with each other. I thank you very much. Okay, we're going into questions, right? <clears throat> all, all questions are welcome. Don't be shy. So here comes the first. Diana uh, wants to know how I got the pictures. It's, I spent a lot of time looking for photos. <laughs> this one with us. <laughs> How, <clears throat> Kyle asks, how long did it take you to write your book? Oh my God, years and years. Uh, Cause I had a full-time teaching job and I did research. I wrote other books and I took some classes. And finally, we, we spent 10 years in Chapel Hill, my wife and I, I was at the University of North Carolina. I taught some of their basketball players, both men and women, but I joined the writing group and a woman named Carol Henderson, every Thursday evening, about seven or eight of us, took turns reading pieces. And I got a lot of feedback, a lot of rewrite. Took a number of years. Thank you, Letitia. 
Oh, they're running by quickly. Uh, thanks. Did you ever have trouble or even still have any trouble talking about some, wait, it's going way too fast. Some of the things you've experienced. Thank you. Oh, yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult. I get choked up, uh, but I think it's important. And I think that even though it happened such a long time ago, we have to remember. And what's happening today? What's happening in places like Syria? What's happening in uh, with immigration on our southern border? What? Why don't? Why aren't we more welcoming of foreigners? This is a country. Uh, unless you're a Native American, your roots go back to somewhere else. And so why not be more welcoming? Lindsay, thank you for your fantastic picture. Oh, how nice. Thank you, Lindsay. And thank you, Kristen. We still have prejudice, racial hatred, genocide. Yes, we must remember and do better. Uh, Annabelle, does everyone have access to these questions so that they're reading them as well as I am? Um, yes. A lot of them are sent directly to the panelist side. Okay. But. Yeah. I mean, do you want me to read each one or I just. Can. Um, oh, do you want to read them? I can read them to you if that's easier. Why um, don't you? I'll save my voice a little bit. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay sounds good. Um, so there's a comment from a student named Daniel. He says, I'm a Jewish international student from Israel here at Eastern. And he wanted to greatly thank you for sharing your story. And there's a question asking if you have ever met Ellie Whistle or Weisel. Or Ellie Wiesel. Oh, but yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, great question. Wonderful, wonderful survivor of Auschwitz. His book, a number of books, particularly a book called Night, uh, his first night in Auschwitz, is read by many uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers and college students, uh, a man deeply religious who questions the presence of God in the gray smoke, smoke, chimney smoke, people's bodies going up. He questions the presence of God. It's a powerful, powerful book. Uh, it's what I left off is that my grandmother was one of 10. Several of her sisters and brothers went to is went to Palestine. They somehow knew that Hitler was up to no good, and so they lived in Israel. They were, uh, you know, they were settlers. They tilled the land. They were happy being uh, living there. But too many Jews in all families did not leave, or they thought it wouldn't be that bad. My own father, when I asked him, well, why did you leave before the invasion? Said, well, we knew it would be bad, but we thought we, we could survive. They spoke German. He had some German business clients. Uh, some other people had property. They didn't want to leave. It's, a, I think, a difficult, difficult decision. And I imagine some of the folks sitting uh, here uh, on this uh, on the Zoom had parents who had to decide should we leave Honduras, El Salvador, Mexico, uh, uh, Argentina, or France, or Europe? Should we leave or should we try to tough it out here? Always a tough decision because you're making choices with incomplete information. Whew. Okay, next. Go ahead, Annabelle. Thank you for that. There's a question from Maria Duarte. She says, could you tell us if Catholic or Christian and Jewish union, unions were common throughout Europe at the time, or were these unions more common in Prague? Well, Prague was different. Prague was, uh, <clears throat> both the Jews and Christians were pretty well educated. Uh, people went to universities together. I read that as many as 30% of Jewish men in Prague before the war married Christian women. That is mostly Catholic or Protestant. Uh, in other parts of Europe, it was unheard of. 
you know, and most people are counseled to marry somebody from their own religion. Parents also want that, but it, uh, Prague was more tolerant. Oh, and we, hello. Can I have one hug and a kiss? Sure, uh, this is Jackson. Oh, five foot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right on cue. <laughs> uh, delightful. Delightful to see the next generation. Anyway, the, the, the student from Israel, thank you. Welcome and uh, keep up the good fight. There's another question. It says, how did your Catholic and Jewish background complicate or ease your upbringing in the United States? Well, I had trouble with God. Uh, in the war, we, in the school, we had religion. And uh, I remember thinking, if there's a God, why is Prague being bombed? Why are my relatives disappearing? And I had no idea where they went. So whenever I asked my mother, where's my dad or where's my grandmother or aunt and uncle? She would say they're on a business trip or they're on a trip. They'll be back as soon as they can. She didn't know that they were being sent on a train to Auschwitz to their deaths. Uh, but yet they were not in my life. And I was supposed to pray to a God who wouldn't protect my relatives. I mean, now, you know, I'm eight, nine, or ten. I'm not a deep philosopher in those days. But I'm trying to figure out why aren't we the good people, including the bombing. You know, why, why was Prague bombed? We were the good people. You know, leave us alone. Bomb Germany. So it, it gets complicated. Um, <clears throat> when I came to the States, I really discovered more of my Jewish heritage and Jewish training than I did or, the, or than I could in Prague. Thank you. There's also another question. It says, how can we as a generation prevent another genocide from reoccurring? <laughs> oh boy. How many days do you have for me to answer that question? <laughs> uh, I think to become educated, to learn what's going on, who's running the show, you know, uh, what's the source of tension and how can we cooperate more with each other? Maybe as uh, Norman Rockwell said, apply the golden rule, learn about your neighbors, learn about the people who are sitting next to you in class when class starts again or next to you on a Zoom. Uh, who are they? What language do they uh, believe, uh, speak? What do they believe? What are their dreams? What are their aspirations? Oh, what don't they like? Um, I think learning about other people and learning to coexist is the only hope for the future. Uh, I think in the United States today, we're too many red or too many blue. Uh, we're Americans. It, it's not just you know, we're either for Trump or against Trump. There's much more to be said. And I think we have to learn to live with each other. Uh, otherwise, no. yeah. Thank you. There's another question. It says, did people have any idea what was happening at the camps at the time or did it only come out later? Both, both. There's a, a considerable literature for example, there was a, a, a Polish uh, businessman and leader. His, his name was Jan Karski, K-A-R-S-K-I. Jan Karski managed to smuggle himself into one of the concentration camps. Uh, some Polish laborers helped him smuggle him in and smuggle him out. He saw Auschwitz. He saw the terrible, terrible conditions. He wrote letters to Churchill and to Roosevelt. Uh, he had a meeting with Churchill. He had a meeting with Roosevelt. They listened to him, but nothing much happened. 
it was, uh, you know, so at the top of the level, the, the problem was uh, Roosevelt and Churchill had to fight the German army, which seemed to be the priority rather than liberating Jews and other prisoners in the camps. But ordinary people living in Europe then did not know fully what was happening in the camps. They did not. Uh, so I'll, I'll, it's a cup, we could spend weeks on that, but that's basically it in a nutshell. Thank you. Um, another question says, did your father feel guilt for surviving the Holocaust? What kind of life did he live after? Yes, great question. And there's something called survival guilt. He was the only member <clears throat> of the family of eight to survive. And he sometimes said, why me? You know, why not my mother or my sisters, my brother? Um, and uh, he was very much uh, opposed to war to killings, to things of that sort. And uh, he tried to reconnect with the members of the family that survived. And that's how I met, I introduced you to three different families who survived. So I, the two years after the war, after he came back and before we went to the United States, we were reconnecting with relatives and to listen to their stories uh, of survival and what they had to do to, to survive were, were difficult. And it, it was also economically uh, difficult because he was a businessman, he had his own factory, never got anything back. So when he came to the States, they sort of had to start over again. My mom was a governess taking care of kids uh, even though she had a college degree, it, it was not easy. It was not, not easy. Uh, and I write in the book how I, for a while, felt a distant from my mom because I wanted her not to speak with, a, with an accent. Of course she had an accent. She was in her 40s when she came here, but I was trying too busily to become Americanized. So there's this whole thing, intergenerational thing, you know, of how you handle it. But eventually uh, I realized that she was, a, my mom saved my life and protected me. And I began to be a little more empathic than a self-oriented 14 year old. I don't know if anybody, any of you would know about that. 14 year olds who care only about themselves. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Stein. Um, there's a, another question. It says, what is your biggest advice for a future educator when teaching about the Holocaust? Wow. Well, first to, to do it and then figure out what you can teach. I spent a limited amount of time to teach anything. So we got a message, your internet connection is unstable. Are we still okay? Uh, you froze for a minute, but you came back, so. Oh, okay. It's not that cold in here. You know, I don't know why I froze. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, a, a typical school system probably has two or three weeks to teach the Holocaust which means you have a certain number of 40 minute periods. What are you gonna teach? You're gonna talk about the camps, about the background, about the history, about how people feel, how they survived, about uh, people who resisted. It's, it, it's, not, it's not easy. The same way, what, how, how do you teach slavery? Or how do you teach racism? How do you teach sexism? Which all of which should be taught in schools. But how much time do you have and what can you teach? 
And then some parents may say, well, wait a minute. If you're going to teach about the Jews, you should also teach about the Native Americans. I agree, but where in the curriculum do you have them? What about Hispanics who came to the United States and settled uh, here in this country and are productive? Okay, so what do you include anti-Hispanic sentiments uh, and racism? It, it's both how much time and what do you teach, but it's important to teach it and uh, for sure. Thank you. Somebody wants to know how many languages do you know? <laughs> do I know or do I speak? <laughs> So I learned German during the occupation. And then for about a year and a half, I studied Russian, which I didn't like, A, because I didn't like the Russian occupation, and B, because they use a Cyrillic alphabet, a different alphabet than, than, I, than I'm used to. And I had a tough time, and I had a, 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 an older student helping me with Russian just enough to pass. Uh, but French I like, and my wife speaks French, so that helps. Uh, and then, of course, I know a little bit of Spanish. I, I need to know a lot more. But my son, who's 35, teaches in a DC public school system. 70% of his students are from El Salvador. So he speaks Spanish and English. That's amazing, thank you. Um, there's another question. It says, what were some of the reasons that people were taken to different camps? Whew, that's a great question. Not fully clear. I, I guess some has to do, but they were extremely well organized. And so the question is, you know, who, yeah, who made, who decided? So some members of my family went to Auschwitz, some went to Mali Trustinets, some stayed in Terezin. I have no idea. Um, they filled up train, you know, you've seen the cattle cars uh, and uh, there, were, there were plenty of schemes. And anyone who was sent to Auschwitz was then branded. They were given numbers, uh, um, you know, in the concentration camps. What all of that signified, I'm not sure, but imagine Think for a moment, sending human beings on cattle cars with no food, no water, no ventilation, overcrowded. I mean, what kind of, but it's other human beings who make up those trains, who make up the lists of people, people's names on those trains. Uh, my dad said in Terezin, everyone was frightened because on a certain day they would post the train lists for the next week and people would see, is my name on it or do I have another week to live here? It was hell. Thank you. There's another question that says, what advice would you give in dealing with Holocaust deniers? Tough, tough. So I had this one guy who was a denier in the college where I taught. And my first reaction is I wanted to have a fight with him. Then I thought, well, what will happen? He actually studied judo so that I would have come out, I think, second best. And I really was concerned about getting the straight message to his students. And my feeling was this guy should not be teaching at a university. Uh, and how do you, you know, are you going to talk them out of it? Or, or there's a famous historian, her name is, uh, her name is Deborah Lipstadt. She teaches at Emory University, and she's written a lot about Holocaust denial. She will not have a discussion or a debate with a Holocaust denier, because she says it's the equivalent of someone saying the world is flat. You're not going to get anywhere. If, if there's not a fundamental agreement that the cause, Holocaust happened or it didn't, you're not going to. But it's dangerous. It's dangerous because 
it can influence other people. And it's, of course, on the internet and other places. And by the way, the Holocaust denial exists all over Europe, in France, in Germany, in Hungary, uh, in England. There are a number of cases. So it's important to seek the truth, to see what really happened. Uh, and denial is something that uh, people use and politicians use. You know, even with this uh, attack on January 6th, Congress was attacked. We see the footage. There's some people who say, oh no, it was, it was, you know, there were good patriots and they didn't mean any harm. And then, you know, they, I mean, we see it with our eyes and people say, no, it didn't happen that way. It ain't easy. Thank you. There's just a few more questions and then we'll go ahead and wrap up because we're sure. about out of time. <laughs> okay. Um, one of them is Mr. Stein, as a Jewish, I know that marriage between Jewish and non-Jewish was not so common back then. Can you provide some details on how your parents managed to get married without experiencing issues? Well, of course they married before I was born, but uh, I'll let's see, <laughs> do the best I can. Uh, I often wondered because my Catholic grandparents had two Catholic daughters, both of whom married Jews. So I don't know how, I think they got used to it. Um, and uh, I did mention that they married in town hall, not, not in a synagogue or a church. Um, they had other friends who had mixed marriages. So I suspect that that helped. Uh, and, but from the point of view of both the Jewish religion and Catholicism, organized religions like to have their people marry someone from their own religion, because that's the way you keep Catholics and Protestants and Jews and Muslims going. So it's always a, a, an issue. There was a film around a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago, maybe a year ago, where a, a Muslim falls in love with a non-Muslim woman and all the trouble that it caused, uh, you know. Uh, so, but uh, neither of them was that religious. My mother was a Catholic, but she hardly went to church. My father was Jewish, he, had, he was bar mitzvah, but he did not go to services regularly. I see there's a question about a film called The Pianist, and um, I would recommend that. It's a great film about the Holocaust and about how one man survives Warsaw. But back to Annabelle, who's in charge of the questions. Oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> Um, okay, this will be the final question. It says, what are some novels, memoirs, or authors you recommend who write about the Holocaust besides yours, of course? Tons and tons. Of course, uh, <clears throat> Elie Wiesel, any of his work is useful. Anne Frank diaries are important. Uh, there are so many uh, are not coming to mind. Well, a Primo Levi, L-E-V-I, Primo Levi, who is an Italian scientist, and he's got two powerful memoirs about his experiences in Auschwitz and takes a, a large picture, a, a sort of a big picture of what happened, uh, written extremely well, and had a tough, eventually took his life, because what he saw and his suffering was so dramatic. But uh, there are tons of, uh, next time you're in Washington, D.C., come to the bookstore and you'll see my book and probably 10,000 others. <laughs> I'm sure you'll, <laughs> you could find something that, 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 uh, that would inspire, that would inspire you. Thank you so much. I definitely encourage everybody to get his book. Is there um, a place, like a specific place where they can get it online? 
Dr. Stein or just kind of search for it on Google and it'll pop up? Well, I hate to say, I, I, I hate to give Amazon a plug, but they, they, they'll get it to you. <laughs> and local bookstores, uh, it's seventeen ninety five, dollars uh, but you can maybe get it less. Uh, I wish I could say I, I'll send you a copy, but I'm not equipped to do that. But it's, it's honestly, I'm biased, but it's a great book and it's easily readable. And it's full of photographs. And if you're an educator, there are questions at the back of the book. And at the front of the book, there's a timeline of Hitler coming to power and what happens in my country and so on. So uh, thank you. Thank you for holding it up, Annabelle. I of appreciate course. it. <laughs> Beautiful. It's really insightful. So I'll definitely encourage everybody who can to get it. And I also wanted to take this time to give you like a heartfelt thank you for giving me the privilege and honor to work with you on this presentation. And I think you kind of touched everyone's hearts and opened everyone's eyes and, you know, just talked about the importance of remembering on his, our history and why, you know, how to prevent things like this from happening again. And so again, thank you so much. And I also wanted to take this time to please encourage everybody to fill out the survey at the end of the presentation and that our next event is going to be April 20th at seven o'clock and it's going to be the Australian Didgeroo music presentation. So I hope you all have an incredible day and thank you again so much Dr. Stein for being here. Well, may I just say thank you and yeah. thank you to Diana and um, I would urge all of you to keep learning, keep uh, thinking, keep questioning, question. Uh, it's important. We all need to survive together and we need to, we only have one earth and we need to work to, to keeping it whole. And uh, I want to wish all of you good luck with your future uh, educational plans, occupational plans, marriage plans, uh, travel plans, <laughs> stay safe. And uh, please wear a mask if you, if you go out. <laughs> we, even though not everyone supports it, we still have the COVID doing its thing and we, we, we need to stop that. So uh, thank you. Great to meet you and be well. Thank you. Have a great day. Great, great.